their lives. When you're out there and you're covered up in gunfire and the air above you is full of lead and the bullets are hitting around you and ricocheting and blowing up and you can't hear yourself think because of the gunfire, it's a little different than watching that on television where everybody gets up and gets to walk away when it's all over. Because that's, that's not what it was. We can't show you his face or use his real name. We've replaced his voice so it can't be recognized. I think that because of what happened on February 28th and the way things went, considering how badly they went, that there's a lot of people that feel that the things that happened weren't necessary and would like to speak out, but they're afraid to. We've agreed to call him Joe, and what we can tell you about him is that he is an experienced agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And the story he has to tell, he says, the ATF doesn't want you to hear. Have you been told not to talk about this? Oh, yeah. All of us were told from the standpoint of, this is our problem. Let's keep it in-house. Let's clean it up. And they try to make it all just disappear into the sunset, and hopefully everyone forgets about it. But it's never been the case where we've lost four agents. And this, this is not something that's going to go away. But on that Sunday morning in Waco, when almost 100 armed federal agents moved along country roads towards the Branch Davidian compound, the ATF assumed that everything would go as planned. So going into it, what was the key to this? What was going to determine whether it would fail or succeed? The key to it at that point, if you had to pick out one specific thing that was a key, that was the element of surprise. You had to have that. It was supposed to have been what the ATF calls a dynamic entry. Within minutes, they would get into the compound, secure the building, and surprise cult leader David Koresh with search and arrest warrants. But that's not what happened. Joe was among the first wave of agents inside the compound. Have you seen this tape before? No, I have not. Can you describe what you see? We were being beat, beaten back. The ATF told the agents they would find the male cult members working outside, away from the women, the children, and the weapons. Joe says agents also expected there would be four helicopters for diversion. There was absolutely nobody away from the buildings as there should have been especially the men, and the helicopters were not there as a diversion, as they should have been, we knew at that point that, that things had definitely, had definitely gone very badly. What Joe says he didn't know at the time was that three ATF helicopters had already been hit by gunfire and forced down. There was no limit to the amount of ammunition that they had. They fired on us with 22s. They fired on us with 50 caliber weapons. They used hand grenades. They used assault rifles. It adds up to a plan that was very poorly conceived. It was never even considered that we might be beaten. Who do you blame for that? I blame ATF for that. The ATF raided the cult in the first place because it was believed to have illegal automatic weapons, a lot of them. Yet only six of the 90 agents in the raid carried assault rifles. Joe says when he and others asked to bring more along, the ATF said no. ATF did not let us go in there as prepared as we could be, expected us to go in there and win a machine gun battle with a pocket knife. They weren't just outgunned. Joe says that he and many others ran out of ammunition before the firefight was over. There were bodies laying everywhere and people shot. And some of them dead. Let's go. Turn up. Was there a moment when it could have been stopped? when it could have been turned around. At the staging area, from that point on, it was a loose cannon, literally. It was a monster that had taken a life of its own. There was no stopping at that point. It was at the staging area, several miles from the compound, that the agents made their final preparations for the raid. And it was there, Joe says, that the operation should have been stopped before it began. At about 9.15, 9.20 that morning, one of the supervisors starts running up and down the line of agents where they're out there getting geared up and getting ready to get into these horse trailers. And he's yelling and screaming at everybody to hurry up, get geared up. He said, we need to go. They know we're coming. The result was one of the bloodiest days in U.S. law enforcement history.
There was no contingency plan that you were presented with at all? No. Nothing built in about what happens if we have to retreat, what happens if we're outgunned, or what happens if we lose the element of surprise, and it backfires on us. The element of surprise is a key issue, of course, and in this situation, uh, the element of surprise was obviously lost. We spoke by a satellite from Waco with ATF official David Troy about what Joe says. You say the element of surprise was lost in this operation. When did the ATF become aware of that? That is a key piece of information. There is no way we would have executed that raid if the people running the operation would have realized that the element of surprise was lost. That would have been obviously a suicidal mission. We were not aware at that point in time and did not become aware that, that the element of surprise was lost until they opened fire on us. Well, Mr. Troy, you may be aware that we have spoken to one of your agents who was part of that operation on February the 28th. I heard that, yes. He has told us the following. I'm going to quote, you, quote it directly so there's no mistake as to what he told us. Okay. He said at the staging area, several miles from the compound, at about, this is a quote now, at about 9.15, 9.20 that morning, one of the supervisors starts running up and down the line of agents where they're out there getting geared up, and he's yelling and screaming at everybody to hurry up. He said, we need to go, they know we're coming. How do you respond to that? All, all I can tell you, Bob, is if the supervisory staff that was in charge of this raid was, was aware and convinced that the element of surprise was lost, there's no way we were going to go driving in there and execute a warrant because the element of surprise was a key factor. So here's an operation where surprise is the key, and 45 minutes before you intend to raid the place, one of your superiors is telling you they know you're coming. Yeah, and for us to hurry up and get there as fast as we can. People may think they have heard something that, didn't, that wasn't said exactly the way they now recall it 30 days later. I think that is a possibility. Will I reject and discount absolutely? There's no way that statement could have been made? No, of course not, because I wasn't there and I don't know what was said. The agent to whom we spoke said that he mm -hmm. and others went to superiors before the raid and asked for assault, assault rifles because they feared they would be necessary. Are you aware of that? No, I'm not aware of that, but, but let me respond to that concept. I think a lot of people are jumping to a conclusion that that would have meant we would have won the gun battle and we wouldn't be in a siege standoff. But I contend to you if we had had 50 or 60 AR-15s in the hands of our agents, we would have had a body count inside that house, probably including many women and children, which would have been unbelievable. This was a massacre. It shouldn't have been four dead people and 16 laid out there, shot all to pieces. You're telling me that all those men, but the men who died in particular, gave everything for the agency, and you believe the agency let them down? I do, absolutely, that's true. Is that part of the reason why you're doing this? That's the only reason. That's the only reason. State officials in Texas are now looking into the deaths of the four federal agents and whether cult members were tipped off on the raid. Meantime, the Treasury Department, which oversees the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, will investigate further and is expected to convene an independent panel to review whether the raid was properly planned. Still to come, you'll meet an unforgettable little girl named Whitney. Statements we've obtained so far, and the Texas Rangers primarily have obtained are inconclusive as to your question. I, I mentioned there might have been evidence of people who wanted to get out. There might have been some gunfire. But I think uh, that we, one of the reasons we knocked a lot of the big holes in the walls there was to give people an, a, an avenue of escape. So I think that that's a good indicator of Corsh's absolute control over the people in there. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, when the fire started, there were sightings that were reported to you yesterday of people setting the fires at the corner. There only would be that as you face the compound, the right end there, where the fire started, you see. But there were other fires around the, the complex. 
Uh, they were starting fires, fires around the complex. There were several fires, but let me, I'll finish here. So then, but we were of the opinion that deep inside the compound, when you, you've seen your pictures, where there's a concrete structure standing there. We were of the opinion that they were inside that structure and that they were able to survive in there with, even with the gas because maybe they protect them from the gas, maybe it was sealed. That was one of the reasons that the, the CEV went so far in, was to deliver gas into that area. So yes, sir. sir. <clears throat> despite, you still haven't answered the question. It's not a question of killed at this point, but people died because of the actions that the government took. What is it that do you have, do you feel that you have a responsibility, and what is the message that you have for relatives who lost people in that compound, in that compound, because of the government's actions? What is your message to those relatives? I don't agree with you that they died because of the government's actions. I disagree with your basic premise. However, I say to them, we were horrified and as saddened as they were, they're lost. There's no question about that. But I disagree with you. David Corris controlled those people's lives absolutely. Well, would they absolutely. Would He's they the one responsible for their death. Would they have died that day had you not gone in there? I don't know if, if would they have died in July, August, September. I think this was his plan from the beginning. It's clear to us. It would have happened 30 days ago if we would have gone in there. So you, you, if you want to, to say, well, if the FBI would have done nothing, these people would still be alive. That's probably true. For how much longer would they have been alive? Are we prepared to say wait? A month, say a year. We're not, we were not prepared to do that. And our judgment was that we could do that effectively. Yes, sir. You say you have absolute certain evidence writing of this biblical manuscript was just yet another soul. Yes. Like, correct. Yes. What is that part of it? It's intelligence information that we're not prepared to disclose now. Yes, sir. Is there any evidence, you have people who survived, that in the minutes the fire began, did Corrish or anybody else issue orders, don't let the kids out, put the kids here, I don't want the kids to leave, and if I could follow up for a second here, uh, you said that you looked at the basic instincts of the veil, that the mother could take the kids out. What was that based on? Well, our opinion based on uh, whether anybody could get out or not was based on discussions with them and opportunities given for people to leave, even discuss with them individually. Uh, the children were absolutely under his control. The tapes we'd play, they would, they would made for us. He would demonstrate his control over the children. For example, that you've been told this before. Uh, do you love God? Yes. What's God going to do to our enemies? A three-year-old child says he'll smite them. This is absolute control over that. I, uh, he, he would not, if the children he maintained in there, if, 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 once he decided this is what he was going to do, he was not going to let them go. Yes, sir. There were one of the people who survived in the rain this morning as they were going to the courthouse. I can't hear you. One of, one of the people who was arraigned this morning who survived the fire yesterday shouted this morning that the fire started when a government tank knocked over a Okay, at least three people observed a person spreading something out in this motion. We were, this was reported yesterday, bent down, cut with a cupped hand, and then it was a flash of, of, of fire. We have aerial observations of multiple fires. So it, the person saying that there was one instance where a, 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 one of the t uh, CEVs may have bumped something, this is not so. We have another person telling us, again, which was reported to you yesterday, that the fire was started with lantern fuel, okay? There has been fuel uh, containers found at the scene. There's no question in our mind that that's how the fire started. Yes, ma'am. The only person to come out recently was Lewis Alanis. What role he played, there's even speculation that he's in there at your behest or acting with the FBI. What role is he cooperating? What part does he play in the intelligence that you're talking about? Uh, Louis uh, Alanis went in strictly on his own, under no, no guidance from us whatsoever. In fact, we were very upset that he got in there. Uh, when he came out, we were uncertain as to his credibility uh, because of his demeanor and, and, the, and the way he was speaking. Um, later on, I think he he decided he wanted to be a little more forthright. But um, some of the intelligence in there was from him, but not as specific as, as we would have hoped we could get from somebody who lived in there for such a long time. Yes, sir. Yeah, you said that, um, that 
I think part of it is plan from the beginning to carry this out. But on the other hand, the government has also said they didn't think he was suicidal. There seems to be a contradiction. Oh, it's not. I'm, talking, I'm judging by his actions. Okay. We know now what his plan was. We heard several times that there could have been suicide, but over and over and over again, he told us, he told his attorneys, he was never going to commit suicide. We did several analysis of whether he was going to, we were prepared as best we could for it. That's why I said earlier, only way we could respond to anything that was about tear gas in order to break the people's yeah. thoughts. Why weren't there fire trucks there if you feared that maybe he would do something? Why wasn't there? Well, do we, uh, the, the suicide, uh, several possibilities. They could have run out with firing guns. They could have poisoned, they could have done a lot of ways. You don't want fire trucks there because the firemen would be in danger. The other point is there wasn't water there where you had to pump it out of the, out of the tank. The, the uh, possibility of fire, just uh, suicide by fire, uh, in those conditions, if we'd have had five fire trucks lying around that place with all the water in the world with that wind, I don't think we could have slowed that fire down one iota. Yes, ma'am. Can't hear. Again, that will be done by the Texas Rangers primarily. There will be a lot of FBI people, the laboratory help, and our disaster team from Washington. I, I think that it will be a matter, I think, with the destruction there, primarily probably dental records, uh, identification. Yes, sir. Do you have definite evidence yet that they've been among the dead, and were there any secret parts of the house that you find find? The uh, possibility of hidden compartments under there is, is still unknown. Uh, n none of the bodies who have been removed from there yet, to my knowledge, have been positively identified. Yes. Can you tell us uh, where the FBI investigation goes from here? Our investigation will be the follow-up of, of what we've had. It'll be an, um, there's an um, examination of the implementation of the plan. We will be supplementing, as, as best we can, the investigation that the Texas Rangers will be doing. If they need something from us, obviously we will help them do it. But as far as the scene, our primary support would be our disaster team and agents to help, with, to include our laboratory experts to help at the scene. Can yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What is going on out at the scene right now, and how many bodies have been seen? Is it only the ones that have been taken out yet? I don't have that information. I think that will be more available. Remember, it's, it's, it's still, you know, uh, ammunition was still cooking and floating, so it's going to be a while before that can be definitely answered. Yes, ma'am. Your reference to a booby trap, I'm not familiar with. We'll be searching for them. I don't know that there ever were any absolute booby traps. I think there was a lot of explosions, but I'm not aware of any, any specific booby trap. Yes, sir. Given, given David Correa's fixation with revelation and the mention of fire at any time, did it ever occur to you that, yes, indeed, this may be the way that he chooses to go out and make your plan according to make the plan that will work i think if 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 we contemplated uh, almost any possibility as far as as the suicide uh the fire part i'm not certain that we, what more we could do yes sir how would you assess the media's role in this story how did this help or hurt i tell you i'm i mean this sincerely i uh I, I, when I, we first started here, I uh, asked for y'all's, I told you we'd be as, as straightforward with you as we could be. We told you we'd report to you every day as, as best we could and ask you to be as professional as we try to be. And I think you've been that way. I think in particular, when we ask you to stay back away from the compound, particularly with, the, with some of the night vision, not all of you complied with that, but the majority of you did, and the fly and everything else, there was, there was not any interference. And the other thing I think is also, I think, is a tribute to the people who were here during the, the whole period, is that while you had contact with us and you saw us away from, from, from here, you did not hound us. You did not bother us. You let us get our job done. And I appreciate that very much. Yes, sir. I just want to bring up this point one more time. You say in a, in a 
commission is organized with the one that we did yesterday. I'm still confused as to why it takes a 911 call to the local fire department to get the fire truck to any call to the fire department is 911. It comes in 911. We, we call them straight in the number we had. We, that, that, that's not a 911 call. Time given from the fire chief, if it's a 45-minute course to burn down, it took them 30 minutes to get there. We called the fire department when the fire started. Yes, ma'am. What's the percentage of that being a little It would be better to ask the Texas Rangers that question. Yes, ma'am. Yesterday, Bob Rick had mentioned that after the initial pounding of the building, a banner was uh, hung out of a window requesting mm -hmm. the phone lines be restored. Right. Unless I missed it, I'm just curious, uh, was that attempt ever made? So yes. why, why not? Do you remember the person that came out to pick up the phone line? Do you remember that part? You saw it on, it was reported on television. <laughs> See, they threw the phone line out. When we made the call in, Steve Snyder disconnected his telephone instrument from the phone line and threw it out the window. That I'm aware okay. of. Okay, let me, let me finish. We go out to, to, to try to restore the phone when they said our phone is disconnected. Remember, they had thrown the phone line out. We knew they didn't have a phone. So we said, gave them permission to go out and get the phone line. He retrieves it, and it's cut off. From that point, we tried to establish telephone connections with them again, safely. Remember, agents were fired at over hundreds of rounds at agents from that compound. So it wasn't like what it was before. We thought we could incrementally move into somewhere because we didn't think it was it was great danger so we, we just couldn't effectively the time that we had left there to get the phone line back but we did try to do a survey yes sir uh, there's been some reports that perhaps the children were uh, killed by injection before the fire assumed the building do you have any evidence of that or is it speculation? there's no evidence of all I, I think that would be uh, total speculation yes sir yeah I didn't hear you. Is this about a town and what happens to the foreign nationals that were burned in there? I think the question about the, what happens to the foreign nationals that were burned in, I think they'll be identified and their, and their families notified. Uh, you asked the question, is this another Jonestown? Um, is, is it where the leader causes the death of all the people in the compound? Yes, it is another Jonestown. Yes, sir. Earlier, when the, the uh, hitting the building was going on and the gassing, you all used your speakers, as Mr. Rick said, to, to tell people to come out. Once the fire started, were the speakers used again to, to advise them to come out and so what was being said? It was repeated, come out, come out. There's openings. It's constantly uh, telling them to come out. And then once the, some of the people came out, and the people in the Bradleys were giving them instructions. Example, two of the people, one person was lying up on the roof, and wouldn't come out. The Bradley even pulled up to talk him to try to get him to come down. He finally fell off the roof and exposed himself to danger. The HRT people gave out and put him out. He was on fire and saved him. Another woman came out who appeared to be disoriented. She went back into the compound. They got out and went to get her. So there was constant communication with everybody to try to get them to come out. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, the fire department people were talking about a plan that had been discussed a week ago, several weeks ago, yes. about just such an incident as this possibly taking place. Why were these people not on the scene? Uh, it's my understanding that when ATF went in originally, they had fire departments in a, for, a fire truck in a forward position ready to go given the nature of the explosives and what was thought to be inside. Why did y'all not have them at least on standby? Okay, if, let's go back to ATF. ATF would never have sent those fire engines in there with that fire that was coming out of that house. It's fine to plan it. We know their firepower. When we when we got here, we already know they have 100 automatic weapons. We already know that. And, we, and they're prepared to use them. There's no way we're going to expose firemen to that gunfire. Yes, ma'am. Why the timing of yesterday morning was, was it that Washington had finally signed off on your plan? Or was there a certain threat from David Koresh that led you? The timing was based on a long discussions and, and several uh, days of planning. Um, the, when the approval was obtained from Washington, finally put, we were all agreed on that the plan that was agreed upon. Uh, we decided that it, when's the best time to implement it. Uh, but we thought the longer time passed, more, the, all, the, all the areas that we were concerned about would become more and more complicated. Yes, sir, behind me.
They were, I think, very disciplined. They put their mask on. The people had masks. They were observed with masks. I think they gathered in an area, a central area, where the where they were the, the, the impact of the gas was limited. I think the people are were in such control, absolute control, that very few of them resisted any instruction until the very end. And there's appearance, like I said earlier, that maybe some of them were forced forced to stay. Yes, sir. I mentioned this question with all due respect because I really don't feel like you have anything to hide if you haven't before, but under the circumstances with the situation no longer posing a threat to you or your agents or anyone else, what, why can't you tell us a little bit more about some of the tactical options that were on Janet Reno's desk to consider and also some of the intelligence that you gathered at the time? Well, I think the, the, the big thing on the intelligence part is, the, is it may affect prosecution. I don't want to get into that part. As far as the general options, I, I, it's the options were a matter of technique more than what to do generally. How many options were on our desk? Well, I think we only, there was one basic plan. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much. This is the last news conference. There will not be any more. The crime scene is in the care and custody of the Texas Rangers. You heard that DPS spokeswoman say that is the last of the 1030 news conferences we can expect. That was FBI agent in charge of the operation there in McLennan County, Jeff Jamar. A couple of interesting things that he noted. Number one, no bodies have been removed from the rubble of what was the Branch Davidian compound, and they have not yet had the opportunity to explore the possibility of some of those underground passageways that we had talked about and had surmised might be under there. Jeff Jamar also said, and you probably heard us talk yesterday about the possibility, not the possibility, but that there was indeed an underground bus to the west of the compound. Jeff Jamar had said that when his agents, after the fire, entered that underground bus, the air was cool. There was no evidence of any type of gas that had Koresh wanted the children to survive, he could have put the kids there. He also said that the introduction of the CS gas was the only non-lethal method of persuasion, if you will, that the FBI had available to it. And he reiterated that the plan was to distract the cult members and perhaps allow for their basic instincts to kick in and thereby rattle their devotion to David Koresh and perhaps save themselves, which was one of the reasons that the CEV continually throughout the morning hours made those large holes in the compound. That was apparently, according to Jeff Jamar, a means of egress for those inside who may have been held against their will. Again, that's the latest from Waco, and that uh, is the final news conference that the FBI will be holding, and we will have a complete update on the situation to this point coming up on our noon news. Hope you'll join us. This has been a special report from Channel 5, the Texas News Channel.